Good morning. It's so good to be here with you today. One of the great joys of my life is to get in to come here uh, every week and share the Word of God with you and the fellowship with you. And you may be visiting here. You may be a, a long-time member. This may be your first time. And one thing I want to remind you today that I think we often need to be reminded of is this great truth, that God loves you. I want you to hear this. This is really important. I need you to understand. God loves you. You may be sitting here and say, look, I'm not the perfect parent. I'm, I'm not the perfect son or perfect daughter. I'm, I'm my, my husband's skills and my wife's skills have, have fallen far. You, you don't know the amount of sin and shame in my life. And the beautiful thing is none of that matters because God loves, covers it all. And so we're so thankful that you're here and God loves you. And I want you to know we love you. I love you. It's a blessing to be here with you. We don't take it for granted that you're here. And we're so thankful that you're here. If you've got your Bibles, I want to uh, invite you. We're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter 6. We're working through the Gospel of Mark. And we'll be in, in there probably until next, next March. Um, and we're walking through and seeing how Jesus is both servant and king. Both servant and king. And our big idea for this morning, if you were to grab one thing out of the message this morning, if you were to be having coffee with somebody this week, and they would say, hey, what was the sermon about on Sunday? It would be this, that only those who have faith will experience a move of God in their lives. Only those who have faith will experience a move of God in life. Is that an exclusivist statement? Absolutely, you better believe it. Several years ago, I had an individual I was walking with and working with, his life was in complete shambles. His marriage was falling apart. He lost his job. Uh, everything about him was just ruined. And it was all based on him. It was all sinful decisions, selfish decisions, prideful decisions. And I worked with and I cried with, I prayed with. I let him come stay with us several nights in our house and work for weeks after weeks uh, to try to move him to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to show him the power of the gospel and how the gospel can change his life dramatically. And the entire time he was just kept saying, he was just looking for the one break, right? He was just looking for that, that, that one miracle, that one piece, that one thing that he could do, and he really believed that it would fix all of his life's problems if he could just find that one secret. But the problem is, beloved, he never found that one secret because it was never in him to find. His life never recovered. His joy never came back. He was never made whole. His family stayed shattered, and he stayed broken. Why? Was it because God didn't love him? Absolutely not. God gave him everything he needed. But what he failed to exercise, and what many of us, both on the pre-Christian side and the post-Christian side, a lot of us fail to exercise the faith that God will use to move in our lives. Without faith, is it impossible to please God? So only those who have this faith will experience the move of God in their life. So let me ask you this morning. You may be sitting here and say, well, are you questioning my Christianity? Maybe, I don't know. Do you feel like I am? Then I might be. <laughs> You're saying I don't have faith? I'm, I'm not saying that intentionally. But if you're an individual and you've been desiring a move of God in your life and whatever that may look like according to the Scriptures and you haven't seen it, you haven't experienced it, you, you haven't felt that move, I can tell you this, it's not on God that the move is not taking place. He's ready and he's willing to come and to bring peace and to bring joy, to bring contentment, to bring salvation, and sanctification, holiness and righteousness to you. Are you in need of a move of God in your life? As we continue walking through Mark in Mark chapter 6 this morning, Pastor Gene, he preached last week. If you didn't listen to that sermon and you wasn't here, uh, you need to go back and listen to it because uh, I, I wrote down several things, just gems that Pastor Gene uh, laid out before us concerning as Jesus was ministering to the woman with the issue of blood and, and ministering to Jairus' daughter, how Jesus was the Messiah over both sickness and death. And so he's left that. Remember, throughout Mark, he's called disciples. He's done miracles. He's done exorcisms. He's done healings and all these things. And he's 
done all that, and now he decides to come back to his hometown, back to where he grew up in. You know, Uncle Joe's right down the street, Miss Sally's across the way. You know, he knows these people. And so this is where we find ourselves. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter 6. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And as he was going around the villages teaching, and he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should not take anything for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Father God, as we turn our attention to your word, may you open our hearts and our minds that we may hear well, listen with holy affections, God. For our good and your glory, may your spirit fill us. And may we be drawn to Jesus today. Amen. The first thing we see really comes in verses 1 through 6, and it's this. Where there is no faith, there will be no move of God. Where there is no faith, there will be no move of God. This, this should not be a striking statement for us. We, we should not just jump at this to say, oh, that, that sounds like a strange teaching. Where there is no faith, there is no move of God. So Jesus comes to his hometown. These are his people. These are the people he grew up with. I mean, he knew who they were. They knew who he was. His brothers and sisters were all there. And he had done all these miracles around Galilee. He had done all this stuff. He had just gotten back from healing the demoniac. He, he helped Jairus' daughter. He, he fixed his woman with issue blood now he wanted to go back to where he's from to his people he wanted to preach in his home church his synagogue he wanted to share the love that he had with those he held most dear and he goes and he preaches his heart out and as he's preaching this is the funny thing about preaching preachers we have this weird thing in our head where we think every one of you is paying attention and cares what we say. I I had a a guy, a dear guy at my previous church. He was a great servant of God. And he was in the choir. And we had a big choir for our size church, like 25 people in it. And he sat directly behind me. And every Sunday, within five minutes, his head is fell over and he's snoring. The reality is not everybody's paying attention, is it? And so Jesus is there preaching his heart out, sharing his love, sharing the gospel with them. And instead of being drawn to him, instead of being ashamed of their sin, instead of seeing the hope and the love that he has for them, that's not what the text says, is it? See, the love of Jesus and his desire to to see his friends, his family, his neighbors come to know salvation. he, He came to share his heart and his love and grace with those nearest to him. And listen, the same is true today. You, you may be here for many a number of reasons, but, but you wonder, does Jesus, can God really love me? And the answer is yes. No matter your hurt, no matter your sorrow, no matter your sin, no matter your sickness, Jesus has come to show you his love. He's come to pour his grace out upon you. But may we not be like the people in his hometown. Listen what the text says. Listen how Mark describes it. It says they were astonished. Now this was not an astonished in a good way. They were astonished in a very bad way. They were amazed, not at because who he was, but who he was not. He was not a prophet. 
He was not some high achieving rabbi. He was the carpenter from down the way. They were astonished. Who does he think he is? Notice how they refer to him. The carpenter, the son of Mary. Now this is a very interesting phrase because people in those days were not referred to by their mother. They were referred to by their father and their grandfather and their great grandfather. So for them to say he's the carpenter, the son of Mary, it's this, who's this bastard man before us? Who does he think he is? They were illegitimizing him to everyone. And then notice what Mark says. They, they took offense at him. Instead of being cut to the quick in their heart of their sin and seeing hope and love and the grace of Jesus, they got mad at what Jesus was telling him. They couldn't explain him, so they began to reject him. Have you ever been sitting there in a sermon and you hear something and instead of taking it in, you get mad at the preacher? And the next day you go to write a letter to him and the email... And you explain to him how horrible of a person he was for telling you that. And here's the crazy thing. If you've ever been sitting there and you've ever thought that the preacher knew too intimately the details of your life and how dare he preach on them to everybody, I can promise you, I've never thought about your sin while I'm in the pulpit. That's Jesus telling you, mm, get it right. Don't write me. Read your Bible. He said they took offense. Take offense at the person that would give their life for you. Here's the deal. They, they were so familiar with Jesus. Listen to this. They were so familiar with Jesus that they were no longer amazed by him. They were no longer in awe of him. How many of us used to be amazed and stood in awe and wonder at what God had done in our life. But now it's not that big of a deal. Beloved, don't allow familiarity with Jesus to keep you from being amazed by him. And it's, I find this interesting. Jesus goes to the people that know him most intimately and know him the best, and those were the people he offended. Much is true in your life and my life. When, when you become a Christian, when God radically saves you and changed your heart, you want to tell and to share those closest to you what God has done for you so that they may do the same for Him. But have you ever shared the gospel when you were saved with your mama or your daddy, your brother, your sister, your sons, your daughters, your cousins, your best You ever wanted to just in love tell them what God had done for you and then they scoff at you and tell you that you're judging them? Who do you think you are? Beloved, here's the deal. They're not offended at you. They're offended by their own sin. And, and here's the deal. You don't even have to say much because the Spirit of God that resides in you convicts them of their own sin. So it's not you they're offended at. It's the gospel message they're offended at. See, they didn't have a move of God in their lives, so they were offended at God moving in Jesus' life, much as the same for you and I. Much of the lost world will be offended at the message you preach and teach. They will be offended that you say Jesus is the only way. They will be offended when you uphold biblical standards of ethics and morality, sex and gender and marriage. They will be offended by all these things simply not because they hate you, but they hate Christ in you. Because you stand for something they could never stand for. You're filled with something that they're not filled with. You, you have something they, they don't have. That, that's peace, that's joy, that's love, that's grace, that's contentment. You have that in Christ. And they're offended at the fact that they don't have that. See, your faith in Christ, you're walking with Christ, you're drawing near to Christ. It will produce within you a real, tangible fruit that cannot be denied by the world. And some will take offense, but others will be drawn to Christ because of your love. And the grace that resides within you. And so what does Mark tell us about this offense? Look what he says. This, he uses this phrase. He could do no miracle now. Now, whoa. Whoa. Let's look what, he could do no miracle there? Did, did, did they stop Jesus from working? No. No. Their unbelief did hinder Christ's work in their lives where no faith exists. Guess what's not happening? Redemption is not happening. Renewal is not happening. Salvation is not happening without faith. That's the gospel. 
he would not do any miracles because of their lack of faith. And, and, and this is, I find this phrase that, that just blows my mind. Mark says he wondered at their unbelief. You may have a text that says he marveled at their unbelief. Think of the centurion soldier where Jesus marveled at his faith. However com- incomplete it was, he marveled at his faith. And now he turns to those who know him best and says he marvels at their lack of faith. May that never be said of me or you, beloved. May we never look to Jesus. May we never see the size of the mountains in front of us and they cause us to lose faith in the one who built the mountain. To the one who can help us conquer the mountain. A lot of times, many of us struggle with this because we we will tell ourselves, why is God not moving in my life? I'm believing for a change. But here's the deal. This is where this word of faith movement and the prosperity gospel, and it's creeping into evangelicalism a little by little. This is where it gets messed up. Belief in yourself, belief in a change, belief in the positive, those are good things, but those aren't gospel things, you understand? See, because belief in yourself, belief in a change, belief in the positive future to come is not the same as belief in a Savior. They're not. And and you and I may sit here and say, why why is a change not happening? Because we're placing our faith in a change and not the change agent, which is Jesus. So we don't want to find ourselves in a place where there's no faith because where there's no faith, there's no move of God. But next we see this great point. That a great move of God is not dependent upon a formula. So in verses 7 through 11, Jesus comes and he gives these disciples some instructions. He says, look, I'm going to send you out two by two. I'm going to give you authority. Very reminiscent. This is like pre-Great Commission, right? He says, I'm going to tell you what to do. Don't go take a bunch of stuff for you. Don't take a lot of things with you. Uh, Go out. And and this this is the deal. This is important to understand because a lot of times individuals will read passages like this and develop a formula. We'll read Jesus' healing passages. So if you read throughout the New Testament, you see many different ways Jesus heals. He heals by placing spittle on people's eyes. He sticks his fingers in their ears. That'd be weird. Walk up to somebody and says, I can't hear. Brother Larry, you just stick your finger in your ears. That'd be kind of weird, right? I wouldn't want that. Ethan tried to stick his finger in Chris's ear earlier, and it didn't work out too well for Ethan. He spoke. Sometimes he didn't even have to be in the room. And what I love about the variety of ways that Jesus does miracles, and I love about this, is it shows us that God doesn't have a formula for working in our lives. So many times we read passages like these, and they're what we call descriptive passages. They're describing an event that is taking place, a historical narrative, and we incorrectly interpret them as a prescriptive passage, saying, if I do A and B, I'll get C. That's, that's not what's happening here. That's not what takes place in the miracles you see in Jesus. Jesus is not laying out for you and I how to do miracles, but he's showing little glimpses of heaven with the miracles. This is not a formula for healing or a formula for ministry that Jesus is giving here. See, a great move of God isn't dependent upon some formula that we invent, but a great move of God is dependent upon one thing, <laughs> God. Throughout the Bible and throughout Christian history, we have seen that God moves among his people and in this world when his people are truly broken, when his people are truly humble, when they're dependent and when they're relying on him. And you can say, well, why is God not moving in our lives? Are we really broken? Are we really humble? Are we truly relying on him? I I was reading the history this week of the Welsh revival in the early 18th centuries. Uh, It was very interesting. It broke out all across the land, and and, and you saw uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people saved. And and people and historians, I've had friends write dissertations on it, try to pick apart how it went. But you know what one of the the determining factors was for this revival that swept across the nation? A single pastor prayed for revival. You know how long he prayed for? Eleven years before he saw a move of God in his life. Eleven years that he stayed broken before the Lord. Eleven years before he was seeing this move of God through his humility. See, God's power is available to every single person. 
But so often we try in our own power, in our own might, and we neglect what is readily available to us, and that's the power of God. As I was reading through these history, I found this story of this, this Welsh lady at, at, at great expense. She lived way far off in the valley, and this was just when electricity was just coming. And at great expense, she had electricity put in her home. And her neighbor asked her, hey, is, was it worth the cost? Was it worth the money? She said, oh, yes, it was. She told her neighbor, she said, every evening I turn the lights on and I use it to, to light my oil lamps and I turn the lights back off. <laughs> How sad, right? We laugh. We say, oh, poor, pitiful old country woman. How often do you and I how often do you and I not access the power available to us in Jesus Christ? How often do we struggle? Do we cry? Do we live in fear? Do we allow anxiety to rip us to shreds instead of just seeing his great love for us and then resting wholly in that? Because sometimes, and this is hard to hear, Sometimes it's not about the change and it's not about the miracle. Sometimes one of the best things you and I can do is to crawl up in the arms of Jesus and just let him love us in the hurt and the pain and the tears. The death is still going to happen. The cancer is still going to come. The lost job will still be there. The broken relationships are still there. And those may not be fixed, but I can tell you what can get you through all that. It's knowing and resting and being filled with the love of God in your life. And it's not about a formula. It's about simply knowing who God is, knowing what Jesus has done to you, and drawing near to Him. There's no formula. It's just a promise. Draw near to God, and He promises to draw near to you. And when he does, I can promise you that you will be filled with his power, his presence, and his peace. The next thing we see comes in verses 12 and 13, this pre-Great Commission text, if you will. And we see the opposite of everything we've been walking through so already. Where there is faith, there is a mighty work of God. Look, 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 look with me at verse 12 13. They went out and preached that men should repent. But how did they go out? Remember, look what verse 11 says. He gave them authority. So they went out and preached that men should repent. See, it was not the power, it was not the might, it was not the wisdom of the apostles that brought the healing. It was the authority that Christ gave them in their life. And here's the deal. The same authority that God has given them is the same authority that he gives you and I to go out and preach the gospel, the repentance of sinners, to the salvation of their souls. He's given us that. You and I have that available to us. Yes, Jesus anoints them. He gives them power and authority. But notice, it was the preaching of the gospel. I, there's this old quote, and I'll paraphrase it, by a, a long dead, centuries dead old saint that people use as an excuse not to share the gospel. And it goes something like this, that, that the gospel is not in... In words, it's in deeds. I'm going to preach the gospel by the way I live. I don't love that. Let me tell you why I don't love that. Because if you only ever live, how will they know what you're living for? If you don't tell them what makes you live the way you live. See, it wasn't the miracles that saved the people. It wasn't the exorcism, it wasn't the healing of blindness, it wasn't the raising the dead to life, it wasn't all that that saved them. It was the hearing of the gospel, the fact that Jesus loved them enough to die for them and save them and, and make them his own. It was the love of God that spurned the love for God in their hearts. And if we never tell of God's love, how will the world ever know of God's love? Well, but we have to have the faith to believe that when we preach and we share the gospel, when we witness, when we testify, when we spend years building relationships, continually sharing the gospel, that people will hear and respond. I got an old brother-in-law. He is country as country can get. I mean, the road he lives on is called UL Road. How bad is that? Right? It's a little town called Centerville, Mississippi. I love my brother-in-law. We, we've been together for a long time. 
And uh, I pray for his salvation every single day. I hope he watches this, too. I hope somebody sends it to him. It would be great. But you know what I text him most, most every week? Hey, man, I just want to let you know I love you and God loves you. And he's going to get you one day. He never texts me back. That's okay. I got Christmas coming. I'm going to see him for like four days straight. And here's the deal. He, he knows the life I live. He respects it. Although he, he does call me a religious politician because he says that's what preachers are. And he just says I'm politicking every time I go to visit somebody or tell somebody about Jesus. He says, you're politicking for Jesus. I said, that's the best kind of politicking you can do, son. But you know what? If all I ever did was, was live a good life around Kyle, would he ever know of God's love? No. See, it's when we share the gospel, people can hear the gospel. And Ephesians 1, 13 says it's when they hear the gospel, the Spirit convicts and they have faith. So if we don't tell, faith is not going to move. The most important healing that took place when these apostles shared the gospel was not physical, it was a spiritual healing. See, see great faith causes a great move of God. I, I remember when I was a teenager, I was about 11th grade, my brother was about 10th grade, uh, we had this big fire going outside in the back of our house, and uh, my, my brother, he filled this... Um, Dr. Pepper bottled up with gas. He said, I'm going to go pour it on the fire. I said, bet. So I'm sitting on the back porch. I'm watching what's about to happen. This is about to be good. And so, look, we've already blown up buildings and sides of our trailer and sawmills. We've done a bunch of stuff with gas we shouldn't have. Uh, all accidental, of course. And so he goes over, and he walks over to this, this just imagine this. He just takes a 20-ounce bottle of gas and just goes on an already going fire. It explodes. It doesn't fizzle. It explodes. He's running around the yard. His whole body's on fire. I fall off the porch laughing. It is the funniest thing I've ever seen. He is screaming, I'm hot. I'm hot. I'm just dying laughing. So I go, I tackle him and put him out. And uh, he, it's bad. Like, it's, as you can imagine, like, it's bad. He is black headed and red freckles from head to toe. And it burned all the freckles off of him. And we take him to the merch room, and my mama, and he's, he's blistered up bad. My mama sat there all night long, as a mama does. And she knelt at the side of his bed all night long, and she prayed for God to heal him and save his life. I'm going to tell you, the next morning, he didn't have a scar, a blister, or a bubble on him. To his consternation, all his freckles came back. And eyebrows grew back. He didn't have a scar, not one. See, faith, faith does things, doesn't it? Miracles happen when we believe. And a lot of times, miracles don't happen because we don't have the faith because we're scared to believe and it not happen, right? How many times have you been scared to believe something big for God and you're, you're worried, if, if, if I believe and it doesn't happen, does that mean I'm a sinner? Does that mean I'm wrong? Does that mean that God... We, we, we think of, of a ton of what-ifs to not have the faith, don't we? Don't we? Haven't you? But that's not how God works. See, one of the things that I've come to learn in my life about faith is God, whether God comes through or not of what we need or won't, the act of faith itself is glorifying to Jesus Christ. And so what we see from our passage is this, that faith enlightens, it empowers, and it exhibits the grace and the glory of God. It enlightens us. We come to know. We come to understand. We come to feel. We come to encounter and experience a real, tangible grace and love of God when we experience and express faith in Him. And when we do express faith, when we do place our faith in Jesus Christ, it empowers us first unto salvation. Jesus, if you remember in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, these that are humble enough to realize they don't have anything, and they place their faith in God. Blessed are those, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. See, when you express faith in the risen Savior, heaven is open to you for all eternity. And you're empowered to live for Christ because the Spirit of God comes in when Christ cleanses your heart. 
It not only enlightens and it only empowers, but through it you exhibit the grace and love of God. Because you've been loved by God, you're able to love others as God loves them. Because you've had the gospel shared with you and believe, you're able to then share that same gospel with others so they may believe. So let me ask you this morning, very simply, very plainly, have you experienced the grace of God in your life? You say, well, I'm not really sure. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question. Have you placed your faith in Jesus' saving work on the cross? Right now, you, you may be going through something that is very heavy and very weighty in your life. And what you need is a move of God. And what you need in your life is an act of faith. And sometimes the faith is not in the miracle. The faith is just believing that Jesus loves you enough, doesn't it? So is your faith leading you to encounter and experience a move of God? Yesterday, uh, Kyle Bone and I, we went with a couple of our, our youth, and we went to the air show in St. Louis and saw uh, all these amazing planes do acrobat stuff. And uh, one of these... The, the big pinnacle of the show, the climax, was the Blue Angels. Uh, they come out, and they do amazing things. I mean, these uh, just beautiful planes come out, and they're flying 400 miles an hour, and they're 18 inches apart doing flips and turns and twirls in the air. And, and by this time, we've been watching planes for about two and a half hours, and, and the Blue Angels show was about 25 minutes long, and, and we were sitting kind of back in the shade, and, and Colton Fisher and I, we were back there talking, and uh, they, they do this, it's this amazing, they do this, all together, four of them, 18 inch apart, they do this, this big roll, and then they all turn like this together, never moving from their position. And Colton makes a statement, he goes, oh, great, another airplane turn. And I'm sitting there, I said, man, you know what's crazy about that? I said, in no world is that not amazing what we just saw. But how crazy is that we've only been here for 25 minutes watching these guys and already the amazing is mundane. How much of our Christian walk is like that? You have had the most amazing, remarkable experience of all eternity take place that you were headed to a devil's hell for all of eternity, busted wide open, and Jesus Christ saved you, brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light, clothed you with his grace. So when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your sin, he doesn't see my sin, he doesn't see how wicked and wretched and worthless we are. He sees holiness and righteousness. And for some odd reason, we move on from that experience because for some reason we quit sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel for ourselves, and we move on from the fact that we went from a devil's hell to a holy heaven and we are no longer amazed by that fact. Look, I'm going to tell you what an old friend of mine, Scott, old John Robson, used to tell me. He said, you got to get over yourself. Because here's the thing. This will happen. The longer we with Christ, what happens for most of us is, let's just be honest. Come on, Hayden, let's, let's pull back that curtain a little bit. Right? Let's pull back the curtain. Most of us, the longer we walk with Christ, the less important he gets and the more important the origin he gets. And we're no longer amazed by the cross and the resurrection. And when you and I cease to be amazed by the cross and the resurrection, our faith will dwindle. And you'll see less and less a move of God in your life. And that's why, beloved, it is utterly paramount that you and I preach the gospel to ourselves every day single day that we are continually amazed by the glory and the grace of the gospel that we will see God for who he is that our love for him would expand and our faith in him would grow and as our faith in him grows you'll see more miracles in your life than you can ever imagine as our team gets ready to come we're going to move into our time of Lord's Supper but before we do our Team's going to come up here to play. Our deacons are going to go get ready in the back and go line up. But before we move into our time of Lord's Supper, I want to ask you, as we think about this move of God, this 
faith in God? Are, are you in need of a move of God in your life? Maybe you are. And as we're praying for this Lord's Supper, I, I, I want to give you a moment. I'm going to pray for us. And if you're in need of a move of God, beloved, I need you. I want you to. I'm begging you to cry out for God. For whatever that need is, you cry out to God. And after the service, myself and Pastor Gene, we're going to be over here at our next steps corner. If you would need prayer for anything or to talk about anything, we're here for you. We want to walk through. Maybe the move of God you need in your life this morning is salvation. Beloved, we'd love to help you through that, but you can do that right now. You can get right with God right now. And you can be made new. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for loving us when we don't deserve it, God. Thank you for your spirit. God, for those of us here who need a move in our lives, which I would dare say, Father, is all of us, would you help our unbelief? May we not be, Jesus, like your friends and neighbors. May we not be offended at the gospel, but may we see your great love. May we place our faith in you. And God, where there needs to be a great move in the lives of my brothers and sisters this morning, I pray you would increase their faith. I pray you would help them see how marvelous, how mighty, and how wonderful you are. And that you do the miraculous, the impossible, the unstoppable in their lives. For our good and your glory. In Christ's name.